Tony had some big news for his girlfriend Ella. There was a merger meeting he had to attend, and it meant he had to leave the next morning, and wouldn't be back until Sunday. The tricky part was, Ella was supposed to be the bridesmaid of honor at a wedding that Sunday. Tony explained that he got a promotion to be the financial director, and missing this meeting could affect the company's future. It was a big deal, worth over two billion dollars. Ella was upset, understandably. They had been planning for the wedding for a long time. Tony apologized, but he couldn't back out. The project was crucial, and no one else could take his place. He promised to make it up with a bonus from the deal. Ella was angry, and Tony could tell. But he had to go, and he hoped she would understand. When Tony came back, Ella was beyond angry. She wouldn't talk to him and told him to sleep in the guest room. There was no intimacy before his trip, which was unusual. Ella's coldness and anger were out of character for her. Tony tried to understand, but nothing he did seemed to calm her down. So, he packed for his trip and spent the night in the guest room. I understood how important the wedding was for Ella because of the tough times her friend Carol had faced. Carol went through a lot. Her ex-husband cheated on her. She battled a threatening illness, and he left her during her slow recovery. It was heartbreaking, but Carol decided to file for divorce after a miraculous recovery. For five years she lived in depression until she met someone special at the grocery store, and her world lit up again. Carol's friends and family, including Ella, had been there for her during the tough times. Now, with a wonderful man named Brandon, Carol was getting married, and Ella was the maid of honor. Everyone wanted to celebrate this joyful occasion, and Ella was a crucial part of it. I knew how significant the wedding was for Ella, and I didn't want to cancel. Despite understanding the importance, I had no choice due to a work commitment. I knew I needed to make things right, and somehow ease Ella's anger. The morning before my trip I tried to say goodbye to Ella, but she had locked our bedroom door and wasn't willing to open it. I expressed my love for her, and assured her that I would call once I landed in Germany. However, I received no response. Sadly, I headed to the waiting limousine that would take me to the airport. Her actions and lack of understanding left me feeling awful and miserable. After 19 years of marriage, I expected more tolerance and care. Before takeoff, I called her, but her phone went straight to voicemail. I left a message, hoping for a response. I sent more messages before and after landing, desperately trying to communicate with her. Still, no response, no voicemails, no texts. It was clear she was upset, and I knew I had a lot of apologizing to do to make things right. Feeling a bit helpless, I decided to reach out to our twin daughters who were away at college. I shared with them about my work trip, the unexpected changes, and how their mom was upset with me. I asked them to check on her and make sure everything was okay. I expressed my worry, and explained that it would mean a lot to me if they could reassure me that she was alright. They, being daddy's girls, understood and told me they loved me. Upon reaching the hotel, I called my boss to get the latest updates, only to find out that the meeting had been cancelled due to a family tragedy for the CEO of the other company. It was rescheduled, panicking. I immediately booked a direct flight to Chicago which was just a 30-minute drive from the wedding venue. With the wedding reception starting at 7 p.m., I figured I could make it by 9 p.m. and still be a good husband. I was confident that my surprise arrival would bring a smile to her face. After renting a car, I followed the GPS to the reception hall. It was just past 9 when I entered, and the celebration was in full swing. Music played loudly, people danced, and drinks flowed freely. The atmosphere was genuinely joyful and I was thrilled to be there, eager to reunite with my wife. The reception had over 200 people, and as I walked in, I couldn't spot Ella. I made my way to the open bar, ordered a double bourbon, and scanned the crowd, reflecting on our journey together. Ella, being five years older than me, had recently divorced when we first met. Her ex-husband, Dr. Clayton Adams, was a resident at Mercy Hospital during their divorce. Clayton, as he liked to be called, got caught cheating with one of the nurses at the hospital. When Ella found out, she kicked him out, feeling devastated by his betrayal. All she wanted was a happy life with children, but that jerk shattered her dreams. After the divorce, Ella went through a tough time dealing with depression and financial struggles. The local jobs paid little, and the divorce divided their assets, leaving her with little support. 
She became a waitress, barely making ends meet. This period in her life helped her understand the pain that her friend Carol had gone through. When I first met Ella, it was love at first sight. I fell head over heels for this amazing woman. Even though she may have felt broken, I saw her as a diamond in the rough. I didn't just see her outer beauty. I fell in love with her heart and caring nature. I became her support, turning her life around and giving her 19 wonderful years. Blessed with the love of our twin daughters. Ella appreciated my serious approach to relationships. We openly discussed fidelity and commitments, making her feel secure. I made it clear that faithfulness was a top priority for me, and I would never tolerate infidelity. I praised her for leaving her cheating husband, recognizing the difficulty of such a decision. I explained that many people might compromise to save a marriage or stay financially secure, but I was proud of her strength to move forward. Trust, fidelity, and determination became the foundation of our marriage. Before this wedding I was living a wonderful life, completely satisfied and deeply in love. Despite Ella looking fantastic at 44, I was five years younger and in excellent shape at 30. Thanks to regular workouts and fitness routines, I was at the peak of my abilities. Our age difference never posed any issues, and we rarely discussed it over the years. Together, we raised two wonderful twin daughters, Mara and Carrie who are now happily experiencing college life and preparing for their future. Our family felt strong and our marriage seemed stable. At least that's what I believed until I spotted my wife alone with Clayton, her ex-husband. Exhausted from the journey, and curious about what was happening, I stood and observed them sitting together. I was surprised by their friendly conversation as they reminisced about the past. I decided to watch for a few minutes to truly grasp the situation. It didn't take long for my world to crumble. I was on the verge of approaching them and interrupting their interaction, but before I could, she stood up, took him by the hand, and led him to the dance floor. She looked stunning in that ivory, fitted dress, and my heart raced, hoping it was just a dance. Her carefree attitude shocked me as they danced to a few slow songs. Sipping my drink, I waited to see what would happen next. Ella seemed a bit tipsy from her flirtatious behavior, which wasn't unusual after a few drinks. She always flirted with me. And that was normal. What wasn't normal was her openly kissing another man in front of our friends. Everyone knew she was married to me, and it infuriated me even more. I felt humiliated and angry, witnessing my wife waste her love. Still frozen in shock, my anger surged as I watched him openly grab her buttocks and kiss her, and she responded in kind. Just as I was about to confront them, they returned to their table and sat in a corner, engaging in passionate kisses hands, wandering under the table. Before I was ready to confront them, it dawned on me that my marriage had reached its end. I remembered my father's advice about respected men not tolerating disrespect. I decided to take action, but not in a negative way. I could have created a scene, disrupted the perfect wedding ceremony, stopped them, and prevented further developments. But why bother? I thought that if she wanted him, she could have him. She was no longer mine. With an odd calmness I took out my phone, zoomed in, took several close-up photos, a short video, and then sent her a text. Great news, dear. The meeting got delayed and I'm back, but it looks like tonight you're in good company. I'm heading home, and I guess you'll be spending the night with Dr. Clayton. Now I get why you didn't answer my calls and texts. Well, have fun and enjoy the end of our marriage. Tomorrow, when you come back home I won't be there. I pressed send and calmly watched, wondering if she would pick up her phone and read the message. As I observed, I saw the notification light up on her phone on the table, and she picked it up. Then she began pressing some buttons, obviously searching for the message. Ella seemed to sober up quickly because I saw her expression turn serious. Once I saw her reaction, I headed from the bar to my car. Ella must have panicked and realized I was leaving, but I dashed out onto the street before she could reach me. As I opened the door to my car, I heard her shout, Tony, please wait! Casting her a cold glance, I simply shook my head, got into my car, and drove out of the parking lot before she could reach me. My phone immediately started ringing, but I couldn't bring myself to answer the call, let alone speak to her. If she wanted to be with her ex, then it was over between us. Heck, after what I had just witnessed, it was over anyway. Twenty-two years after divorcing that cheating jerk, she was throwing herself back into his arms at the first opportunity. Well, 
She'd have to explain it all to her family and kids because it was all on her conscience. Dozens of frantic text messages started flooding my phone. Tony. Please come back. Let me explain. I love you. Please come back. Tony wasn't what it seemed. I love you. But after two days of a ten-hour flight, two days without answering calls and messages, a cold demeanor, and seeing her with Clayton, I wasn't in the mood to hear her apologies. In fact, I was angrier than ever, and didn't want anything to do with her or her nonsense. After twenty phone calls and messages, I stopped and sent her one reply. The text I sent read, disappear from my life. My work was going well. My kids were in college, already funded, and nothing tied me down. I was still young enough to start over. On my way back to Nashville, I stopped at a diner to grab a bite and take a nap in the car before continuing the journey home. While devouring bacon and eggs I decided to let the world know what I was feeling. Between bites I changed my social media status from happily married to single. Then, I posted two photos I had taken showing Ella and Clayton, passionately kissing at the wedding. In the second photo, his hand was clearly on her chest. Under the picture I explained that Ella was bargaining and returning to her ex-husband, and now I was back on the market. Yes, it was immature, but in my view it was the truth. I was moving on without her. The funniest part was that Clayton, her ex, was almost fifty years old. He was balding, overweight, and not trying to appear vain. Definitely not an upgrade in any sense of the word. What was she thinking? Leaving us for some old, worn-out guy who had cheated on her over twenty years ago. Maybe she wanted to be with a doctor rather than an accountant. Honestly, it hurt. Actually, it hurt a lot. In that moment, I felt more pain than I could ever remember. I was sad and angry. But it also made me laugh at the absurdity of the situation. She was tearing apart our nineteen-year marriage for an old man who had betrayed her more than two decades ago. He could have her. And they deserved each other. I wasn't the kind of guy who tolerates such disrespect. I'm sure there are many guys who would say it was just a kiss and some touches, and there's no reason to leave her. Sorry, but in my world either my woman is loyal to me, or she's free to be with someone else. We all live with our choices. After a late breakfast and a two-hour nap in the car, I hit the road again, and pulled into my driveway at 7 a.m. when I turned on my phone. It started ringing with dozens of notifications. There must have been more than a hundred messages from her. Her parents, sister, and friends. Five minutes after turning on the phone it started ringing, and I noticed it was Ella. I wondered if she had slept at all last night, or spent it with Clayton. Regardless I simply ignored her calls because it was now in the past, and my focus was solely on getting what I needed from the house and moving forward. I had a good relationship with her family, and when they called me that morning, I answered their call and explained to her father what had happened. James. I had no idea she was unhappy in our marriage. But the betrayal dealt a deadly blow to our happy life. The disrespect she showed in front of people we know is something I can't accept. No. It was clear she still had feelings for that guy, and now she can be with him. I intend to find a woman who appreciates what I can offer. And remains faithful. James. I have no other choice. I'm moving out today and immediately putting the house up for sale. Tomorrow morning I'll contact a lawyer to file for divorce. Call me old-fashioned, but I won't live with a woman who wants to be with someone else. She made her choice but I don't believe she acted wisely this time. James arrived an hour later, pleading with me to wait and talk to her before taking such a drastic step. After he asked me to give her a chance to explain, I told him to look at that photo again and see how openly they touched each other at the wedding. I would never tolerate that, and doing it with her ex was just another slap in the face for me. Her father was disappointed with her actions, and my decision to act so quickly and decisively. If she had stayed true, she could have had a happy life with a secure future. Her world was about to fall apart because my anger and humiliation overshadowed all the love and memories buried deep in my soul. All I wanted now was to seek revenge, and make her understand what she had turned away from. Gathering my belongings, I sat at the kitchen table, and had the last cup of coffee in the home we had built together. Sorrow and anger filled me as I placed the empty cup in the sink. I left a short note on the table, asking her not to call me, and we would talk once the divorce papers were ready. I didn't bother signing the note. I just placed my wedding ring on top of the paper. Before leaving for the last time, I opened my laptop and divided our assets, 
also cancelling our joint credit card after settling the remaining balance. From today, she was on her own. If she fought the divorce, she could easily handle all the bills herself. She couldn't afford the mortgage and utilities. The house would be in demand, and quickly sold at the right price. If she didn't resist the divorce, we could swiftly end this sham of a marriage, and she could go back to her beloved Clayton. I left my former sanctuary for an unknown new world. Later, I heard from my friends at the wedding that after I left, Ella was in despair. They couldn't get her to stop crying until she finally lost consciousness from drinking and exhaustion due to uncontrollable sobbing. Her friends felt terrible and worried about Ella. They called me several times, leaving voicemails and text messages, pleading for a callback. To prevent her from ruining the wedding reception, the girls took her back to the hotel room, tucked her into bed, and checked on her multiple times that night. When she woke up early in the morning, and remembered what had happened, she tried calling me repeatedly, begging for forgiveness and a callback. I didn't want anything to do with her after what I had witnessed and never answered any of her calls or messages. On a Sunday morning, Ella woke up with a severe hangover and the fear of divorce. She had flown home at noon, and her dad had picked her up at the airport. Later, she learned that Tony had told her father not to pick her up, and she needed a ride. Judging by her father's concerned expression, she must have looked terrible. Her dad was her pillar of support, and when she saw him there, she rushed to him, embracing him and crying into his shoulder. Dad, I messed up, and I think Tony will leave me. With a sad face, he quietly addressed his suffering little girl. I talked to him this morning, and it doesn't look good. You know, Tony. What were you thinking? And with Clayton, I don't know what I was doing. I was drunk and angry at Tony for not coming to the wedding. I know I messed up, but he has to forgive me, Daddy. I didn't even sleep with him after the divorce. Sweetie, judging by the pictures I saw, you might as well have made love to him. I'm not sure he's the kind of guy who forgives too quickly. You know, Tony, and being with another man the way you were in those pictures was a betrayal to him. As she entered the house, she prayed that Tony would be there, waiting for her. But knowing Tony, she knew he had probably left long ago. The rest of the day, she spent in tears, reaching out to Tony's mobile phone. Hoping he would at least talk to her and give her a chance to apologize, Ella realized the irony of cheating on Tony with a man who had betrayed her many years ago. Tony, the only man she loved, and the life she cherished, seemed to be shattered in an instant. Confirmed by his engagement ring, on a short note left on the table. Meanwhile, I moved into the company's apartment used for out-of-town stays. Since no one planned to use the apartment, I called my CEO, Bill, who was a good friend. He had gone through something similar many years ago, and agreed to let me stay there after I told him this story. In fact, he suggested that I put dating on hold for a year to accumulate experiences for the future. The next day I went to my office on the 16th floor. Ella would never have passed through security if she had come to my workplace, and I gave strict instructions for her to be escorted out of the building if she showed up. They did a good job. And when she did appear on Monday, she was informed that there would be no interaction at work. She desperately tried to talk to me, but I didn't want anything to do with her. She didn't know where I stayed, and I didn't answer her calls. She was completely isolated, angry at herself, lonely, and afraid of her future. Worried about their mom, I received several desperate calls from my daughters. They begged me to talk to their mom. I explained that their mom had chosen to be with another man and everyone knew how I felt about betrayal. Before they could protest, I explained that what she had done was a betrayal in my understanding. My daughters knew better than to argue with me, and they respected my decision. I calmly tried to explain that their mom preferred another man over me, and I no longer had any obligations to her. Our divorce was inevitable, but I would always be there for them and wanted to keep them in my life. I told them to remember this when they got married and never show disrespect to their husbands or betray them because most men wouldn't tolerate such a level of disrespect. Funny things happened after my post on social media. Besides all my friends and relatives calling me to explain, I became popular among women. Suddenly, I was on the market and started communicating with women much younger, full of energy and enthusiasm. Ella's complaints and whining disappeared, replaced by loving text messages and the constant pursuit of cheerful girls. A month later, I met my future wife. Cheryl, and we quickly bonded a few months after the finalization of the divorce. 
Ella was upset when she learned about my new lifestyle. Mostly, she was angry at herself, but also jealous and resentful of me for not giving her another chance before the divorce. I rejected all her requests for a meeting and communicated with her only through lawyers. In the end, the house was quickly sold. After paying property taxes and closing costs, there was less than $1,000 left in capital, which I directed to transfer to Ella. The lawyer persistently argued my options, but the court ruled that they couldn't specify possible future earnings and used my average income for a settlement agreement. Since Ella was working, paying alimony wouldn't be a problem, and I eventually agreed to support her with $2,000 per month for two years. Not an extravagant amount, but sufficient for Ella to survive until she got back on her feet or found another simpleton to marry. But it wouldn't be me. In the following years, I never spoke to Ella and communicated only through our lawyers. Eventually, she moved to Chicago, where she had friends and a support group. With no other prospects, she moved in with the aging doctor, Clayton Now, She would never be as happy a woman as she was with me and she realized that she lost me because of her anger and selfishness. Not that she didn't know how I would react, but she made the wrong decision. She never had love with him that night, but she knew me and still made the wrong choice, behaving like a lonely woman on the prowl. We actually met at our daughter's graduation three years later. Ella had tears in her eyes as she met my 28-year-old pregnant wife, Cheryl, and our one-year-old daughter, Jolene. Ella was around 40, seven years old by then, and the years had been unkind to her. Dr. Clayton accompanied her, wisely keeping his distance. Later, that same day, Ella finally stayed alone with me. Tony, you never gave me a chance to apologize. I should have known better. Not a day goes by when I don't regret my foolish actions that weekend. We had everything, and I gave it all up. You were the perfect husband, and I miss that wonderful life we lived together. Ella, that's in the past, and I forgive you. Yes, I never thought you'd be in his arms while I was away, working on our future, but I really need to thank you. You gave me nineteen wonderful years and two wonderful daughters. I will always love you for that. Ella, the truth is, because of your betrayal, I found Cheryl and creating a new family allowed me to let go of the anger I held against you. You need to take care of yourself and live for your future. Our past is just that. The past. Good luck, and I look forward to meeting you at our daughter's future events. Just then Cheryl approached me with our daughter in her arms, and I introduced them. The age difference was obvious. At 47, Ella could have been Cheryl's mother, and Ella once again regretted losing a beloved man because of a night of anger and selfish acts. Over the next ten years we met at our daughter's weddings. She never got married but continued to live with Clayton who treated her well. Seeing me with a new family and two little girls, she remembered so many fond memories. Now that happy life she once enjoyed was gone forever, and ultimately, she would live a quiet life, filled with regret over lost love and good times. As a final act of revenge that summer after my stock options were realized, I bought my old house, which was again up for sale. My entire family and friends, except for Ella, were excited about the return of the old house, which held so many memories. My daughters enjoyed visiting us and reminiscing about the time when they grew up in our loving home. It's a shame Ella chose a different path. She would have liked to be here, and live the life we planned together. But life goes on, and I find joy in creating a new life and new memories with my wonderful wife and my little girls.